One of the most fabled countries of the Western world is Ireland, a body of land about the size of South Carolina, yet the home of a legendary and literature everywhere known and loved. An estimated 15 million Americans trace their ancestry to this little island with its long and tragic history. For centuries, all of Ireland was held in subjection to the British. But in 1922, the part of Ireland, now known as ERA, gained its independence, while Northern Ireland, predominantly Protestant, remained within the United Kingdom. The capital of Northern Ireland is Belfast, a thoroughly modern city of 440,000 people. Vigorous and aggressive, Belfast has built itself up to its present position in less than 100 years. Center of the important Irish linen industry, Belfast is also famed throughout the world for its shipyards, where some of Britain's great ocean liners have been built. Many of Ulster's Protestants are known as Orangemen through their ancestors' loyalty to William of Orange, King of England, two and a half centuries ago. Now, as in olden days, Orangemen turn out in full regalia each 12th of July to celebrate the Battle of the Boyne, William's signal victory over the Catholic House of Stuart. But Northern Ireland's pride and its loyalty to Britain is more than matched by the pride of era across the border in its newly won independence. In the free and sovereign state of era, so different from Northern Ireland in politics and religion, independence is first in the thought and speech of every citizen. Since we have only recently won the political independence we have been battling for two centuries, our nationalism is still too much in our thoughts to make worrying about the rest of the world a major concern of ours. Freedom has brought no riches to Ireland. We have lived too long and too intimately with poverty to be rid of it in a few short years. Ireland is agricultural in the main, and the southern counties have little in the way of industry. But in every market town where the farmers go to sell their beasts or their produce, to drive their bargains for a few shillings gain. There's talk of Ireland's future and of politics. For if this land is poor, it is still ours to make or mar. To Irishmen in every land, Ireland's very names are magical. Connemara and Galway, Killarney, Donegal and Innisfail, names that live in the laments of poets who have sung to sweeten Ireland's wrong. Yet few of them there are on the outside who would care to trade places with Ireland's farmers and they toiling and working from the rising of the sun to its setting to till the soil that bore them. But spare us the living yielded by our land we Irish have fought again and again to set it free, to make our farms and cottages our own and Ireland's own. Through centuries of want and oppression, we Irish have learned that few things are easily won or easily held, be it a roof over our heads, or wool to clothe us, or a fire on the hearth to warm the children, or freedom to live in our own way. Strong is most Irishmen's love of the church St. Patrick brought to Ireland from Rome in the 5th century. As Yeats wrote of the parish priest, but Father John went up and Father John went down, and he wore small holes in his shoes and he wore large holes in his gown. All loved him, only the Shoneen, whom the devils have by the hair, from the wives and the cats and the children to the birds in the white of the air. Yeah. 
In Ireland, religious faith is no mere convention, for deep in the Celtic nature is a hunger for the things of the spirit. Most of our people are Catholics, but freedom of worship is complete and church and state are separate by our constitution. Maynooth College carries on the traditions of those Irish scholars who kept Roman culture alive throughout Europe's dark ages. The priests it educates go out to every corner of Ireland, not alone to keep strong the piety of our people, but to shape their moral thinking as well. The Irish family that sends a son to Maynooth may forever after hold up its head in the presence of its neighbors, for there is no higher calling among the young men of Ireland. And for 15 centuries, men of God have been helping to form the character of the Irish people, their faith, their culture, and their way of life. Today, Ireland's people who have known so much of tragedy and bloodshed are at peace. Race week at Leopardstown still brings out all of Dublin and thousands from all over the land to put a few bob on the winner. A love of horses comes as easy to the Irish as politics, for the breeding and racing of horses has for hundreds of years been at once a hobby and a livelihood to many of them and it's in our nature to take a chance. Other sports have gone on undisturbed in Ireland while the world has been at war. When we go by the thousands to the great football and hurling matches, and sit or stand packed together while the game goes on, we have a sense of our unity and our nationality. Prime Minister of Era is New York-born Eamon de Valera, hero of the Irish Rebellion and one-time mathematics professor. Today, he continues to voice the program he launched in 1932 to make his country economically self-sufficient. The political aim is to secure the unity of Ireland and its international recognition as a sovereign state. The economic aim is to make the country as self-sufficing as is reasonably possible. In all our work, it will be noticed that there is deliberately a strong bias towards rural rather than city life. Under de Valera's land settlement scheme, Irish families in great numbers were moved from the stony lands in the west of Ireland onto the fertile areas which the landlords had once reserved for their livestock. With government encouragement, Era's wheat acreage has been more than doubled over a period of five years. Irish bacon and hams are famed for their savor the world over, and the meat packing industry has continued to flourish. To many parts of the world goes condensed milk from the government-owned plant in Limerick, in the heart of one of the world's richest pasture lands. And other dairy products, such as butter, are constantly improving in quality through scientific methods developed in ERA's agricultural schools and colleges. For fuel, ERA largely depends on the peat bogs, which cover one-seventh of its land. In developing peat resources, the cutting of turf by manual labor is being supplemented by new methods and new machinery. And in the factories of County Kildare, macerated peat is compressed into briquettes for marketing. Today, ERA is becoming increasingly industrialized. To its old industries, such as brewing, many new and important ones have been added. The Ford assembly plant in Cork, with a pre-war capacity of over 12,000 cars a year, is an industrial asset to ERA, now that peace has come in Europe.
Another important peacetime industry is rubber. Dunlop, the inventor of the rubber tire, was a Dubliner who long confined his activities to England because Dubliners objected to the smell of rubber factories. An important product of the Dunlop plant in Cork has been rubber boots. This county, too, produces thousands of shoes each year. Greatest factor of all in building the new Ireland has been the Shannon hydroelectric scheme in Limerick, which furnishes the power that makes all these new industries possible. Power from the River Shannon, largest river in all Ireland or Great Britain. Endowed by the state at a cost of 10 million pounds, the great project at Ardna Crusher took 4,000 men four years to build, required 75,000 tons of machinery, 11,000 tons of steelwork, 65,000 tons of cement. Today, the Shannon scheme, with its far-reaching power lines, supplies much of ERA with cheap electricity. In the first seven years, use of electricity in Irish homes and industries more than trebled. Thus, throughout the 26 counties, the government's economic program is well underway, with modern industry firmly established in a country which, a generation ago, was almost purely agricultural. An important part of the government's social program is the erection of new hospitals, for Ireland has long held a proud position as a medical centre. It was in Ireland 200 years ago that the first maternity hospital in any English-speaking country was built, largely due to the efforts of a famed and benevolent Irish physician, Dr. Bartholomew Moss. One of the most cherished projects of the new era is a vast national housing scheme. Thousands of thatched cottages are giving way to new and modern homes. Unsightly slums are being replaced by modern blocks of apartments to meet Ireland's housing needs. Proud of its new nationhood, ERA has restored ancient Gaelic as the national language. Under the guidance of a prime minister who is a Gaelic scholar, as well as a mathematician, it has become the language of primary instruction in ERA's schools. For this revival of the time-honored speech of Ireland's people is counted on to strengthen the sense of national unity. Today, a new generation is growing up whose natural speech is that of Ireland's early literature and civilization. Eamon de Valera, pursuing his dream of a self-sufficient and peaceful era, has succeeded in maintaining his nation's complete independence. Biggest international problem before de Valera and his nation in recent times was the question of whether to join with Britain against the Axis in World War II. Era's position as a sovereign state left her free to make her own decision. But between Fina Foyle, led by de Valera, and the Fina Gael, the opposition party, long led by William Cosgrave, there was no difference of opinion on the issue of neutrality. 95% of ERA's people were convinced that to enter the war on Britain's side would have been to betray the cause of independence to which Ireland's heroes devoted their lives. Men like Daniel O'Connell, who won for Ireland religious emancipation. Hugh O'Neill, the rebel Earl of Tyrone. Michael Collins, hero of ERA's revolution. And the lost leader, Parnell. Thus, Ireland's unhappy history under British rule was an important factor in ERA's decision to remain neutral a decision which the freedom-loving nations of the world found difficult to comprehend. But those who would understand this proud and sensitive people, today and in the future, should look not to logic, but to the poetry of the Irish. The world wears on to sundown, and love is lost and won. But he recks not of loss or gain, the King of Ireland's son. He follows on forever, when all your chase is done, he follows after shadows, the King of Ireland's son. <laughs>